Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day. If you are interested in true crime stories like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. In today's video, we are headed to Canada. We will be talking about the case of Alex Radita, a young boy who died from negligence from his parents. This case is especially hard because it was so prolonged for this poor little boy. Join me as we dive deep into the events surrounding the death of this innocent boy. Alexandru Radita was born January in 1998 to his parents Emil, which was the dad, and Radica, who was the mom. Alex was one of seven children. Alex was very young, just around two or three years old, when he received the news that he had type 1 diabetes. His mother had a firm conviction that her son did not suffer from diabetes, and she was certain that she, along with God, would disprove the diagnosis that the medical professionals had made. Alex was five years old when his parents were telling other members of how high his blood sugar levels were. Because of this, he was unable to control his diabetes and wound up in the hospital, where he was dangerously close to the end. Because of this, and because he was not being taken care of properly, he was placed into foster care, where he was provided with excellent care. He was there for about a year. He had a very successful year overall. The social worker advised against returning him to his parents due to the fact that they had previously failed to provide proper care for two of their other children. If they can't take care of the healthy kids, how are they going to be able to take care of one as severely ill as Alex? The family not only moved once, but they moved twice, which prevented the investigations from being completed. The social worker expressed a ton of concern that they would relocate once more the judge disregarded her recommendation and instead decided to return Alex to his parents. The caseworker was not only concerned about them moving again, but also that he was not getting proper care and they kept moving around, so it was hard to keep track of them. The subsequent three years, to our knowledge, everything was okay. There was nothing reported in the following three years. After that, Alex's mother made the decision to stop giving him insulin altogether. She never brought Alex back to a physician again. Yep, she just decided that he just didn't need it anymore and she was going to stop giving it to him altogether. She is a complete Looney Tune. And I, when I say Looney Tune, I probably shouldn't refer. She was dangerous and evil and just was not giving Alex the care that he desperately needed. So then the family moved from British Columbia to Alberta. As to be expected, and as the social worker in British Columbia was instructed to close the case in the file because there just wasn't enough information for the case. It was discovered that he had been given diabetic medications and equipment in the amount of thousands of dollars in Alberta. It doesn't make sense that he wasn't taking it because he had all the equipment and insulin there. So what were they doing with it? Just hoarding it and setting it aside? However, he did not get any in the previous half a year by this time. In Alberta, he was not a student at any time. So after they moved, it was like they just checked out on taking care of him altogether. His health was deteriorating. He he wasn't going to school, just a total mess. It was claimed that he did enroll in an online class, but failed to complete any of the assignments. And so as a result, he was kicked out of the program. He just wasn't participating. Now we get to the day where Alex is not doing well at all. And when I say not doing well, I mean he is not doing well. His parents phoned members of the church and told them that he had been resurrected despite the fact that 
he had already passed. They belong to a Romanian apostate church, which does not impose any restrictions on its members when it comes to seeking medical care. So that's not an excuse for Alex's parents. Like they didn't believe in not giving you know, blood transfusions or anything like that. Emil and Radhika shared with other people who attended the church that a miracle had taken place. Jesus saved Alex. The court heard testimony from one of the group members and his name was Marius Seiten. Marius stated that he had received a phone call from one of his close friends and the close friend is, is telling him, have you heard the news about Alex that you know, that he had died, but was brought back to life. He was resurrected. The friend continued their statement, the child was dead and now is alive. Go there and you will see what happened. This is not 1880s. This is, this is the 19, this is the 2000s, you guys. This is not, this is not a long time ago. This was what? seven years ago, maybe 10 years, I don't know. But anyways, my math in my head, but anyways, it wasn't that long ago. So these beliefs of him being resurrected is just ludicrous. The church member Marius then stated that he had called Alex's father, Emil, and was asking him, you know, is this true about Alex? What happened? According to the accusations, Emil, the dad's response was, I don't know come on over to the house and pray with the family. And so that's exactly what Marius did. He went over there and he saw the family and um, the other siblings all praying together as a group. And so the mother goes on to explain to him that Alex had been declared dead, but he was now alive, but that he needed to pray for God to give him some strength to his body because he was still very fragile. He then asked to see Alex after, you know, praying with the rest of the family for a while. And so Maria stated in his testimony that Radhika, the mom, asked him, are you sure you want to see him right now? And Marius was like, yes, I would definitely like to see him right now. So after that, they walked into the bathroom where Alex was at and was stated to be hiding. After being taken aback by Alex's condition, he demanded to know from Radhika whether or not Alex was still alive, and she assured him that he was indeed alive. He didn't look alive, but Radhika assured him that yes, he is still alive. Marius went through his observations on the scene. He was not particularly muscular at the time. Alex wasn't. The color of his skin was white and he was staying perfectly still. Marius went on to say that Radhika stated that two hours ago, uh, she wasn't sure of the time frame, an hour or two hours ago, that he had been breathing. Uh, he had been breathing two hours ago? You know, you don't not breathe. For, but anyways, and then she goes on to say that Alex had blinked and that he had also made a bowel movement earlier in the day. You guys, you know what that means. Anyways, the family then proceeded to go to their church. They just left Alex there, we're gonna go to the church, and we are going to pray. So one of Alex's siblings testified that God had worked in Alex, that he had died during the night on May of 2013, and that God resurrected him. This testimony was given to the 25 people who gathered to pray at the church. They heard it too. After that, around 8.30 p.m. in the evening, 15 people from the church assembled over at the household in order to pray for Alex. The pastor of the church stated that he went straight to Alex's bedroom because now Alex has been moved from the bathroom to the bedroom is, and was stunned by the image that they saw. When I saw him, I knew it was a significant issue. Uh, you think? I was, he would go on to say that I was aware that he was no longer among us. I informed Emil that he had to contact 
an ambulance right away. That has to be an image that this pastor will never get out of his head. That evening at around 10 or 7 p.m., Emil made the decision to phone 911. Alex was discovered by the paramedics wearing only a t-shirt and a diaper. Mind you, this is a 15-year-old boy. Alex had passed away for hours by this time. A medical examiner by the name of Dr. Gulfton reported that Alex did not have any teeth that were functional and that he was covered with dozens of ulcers and uh, all over his body, including a major lesion on his neck that revealed one of his salivatory glands or salivary sel glands. This is neglect to another level. On one of his toes, he had a sort that looks suspiciously like gangrene. Gangrene on your toe can actually kill you as well. He was riddled with illness and germs that were found on every part of Alex's body, from his kidneys to his adrenal glands to his spleen. His body was completely overrun with illnesses. The muscles of his neck had been completely liquefied. However, there is a catch here. This is wild. As I mentioned, while the family was still living in British Columbia when he was diagnosed, Alex had been taken away, you know, he was taken away, given to foster care because they were ignoring his symptoms and not giving him care. But after some time, the judge had given Alex back to the parents. After that, the family relocated. But unfortunately, the records from the Child and Family Ministry were not brought with them. This happens over and over again in the States. They, we really need a national system. It is so obvious and it's so maddening. But this is not just a U.S. issue, apparently. This happened in Canada. The prosecution of the Crown proved that the parents had access to a significant amount of information and that their son's health deteriorated as a result of their failure to give him his insulin or take him to a doctor. There is universal health care in Canada. There's just no excuse at all. It was just cruel. They stood there and they watched their son in pain for months for years and did nothing to help him. You by now have seen the pictures. Does this look like a healthy kid? Does this look like a 15 year old boy? This is the last picture of him on his 15th birthday. A happiest of happy days but he just looks exhausted. They purposely withheld insulin from him on many occasions and for prolonged periods of time. The fact that he went hungry actually prolonged his life it's really bizarre because before insulin became widely available, the only method to extend a diabetic's life was to force them into starvation. But of course, this wasn't something the parents was doing as a cure. No doctor had ever suggested this and modern medicine does not follow this. So what happened to Alex had is that at one point, he had developed a rash, which a physician suspected was caused by one of the two insulins that he was required to take on a daily basis. During this time that the rash was healing, the physician halted the injection, thinking that the injection was the cause of the rash and we need to determine what's going on. Well, the mother, I use that term lightly, stated that Alex had another outbreak of a rash. And so she decided to cease administering insulin to her son without first seeing a medical professional. The net effect of the reduced insulin intake was that although he ate, his body did not absorb nutrition. Alex was only 37 pounds at the time of his death at 15 years old. Alex was pronounced dead in May of 2013. He passed away as a result of bacterial sepsis brought on by complications of untreated diabetes and 
starvation. The court in Alberta found his parents guilty of first degree murder in 2017. The prosecutor on the case stated, quote, it most definitely could have been stopped before. If you are responsible for a child or a loved one and you see that they are ill, you need to take them to the doctor. Traditional remedies and homegrown cures are no match for modern medicine, particularly in the metropolitan area like Calgary. The police have not established a motive for the suspected murder, but they do not believe that religious views played a role in the decision to carry it out." Unquote. So if we rewind a little bit, in 2004, the judge, his name was Cohen, that made the decision to bring Alex back to the family from foster care, that judge that was residing over that, he made a statement that the parents had a deep-seated mistrust of authority figures since they had been raised in Romania under the oppressive authoritarian role. Not my words, you guys. But what he was trying to do is make the point that they just don't trust doctors and that they had a hard time coming to terms with the diagnosis of diabetes because no one in their family had ever suffered from that condition. Alex was admitted to the hospital on two separate occasions while he was suffering from severe malnutrition. Why nobody stepped in? I don't know. The judge that was investigating the circumstances surrounding the death of Alex was trying to learn and try to ascertain what actions could be taken to prevent future incidences of similar nature. On the one hand, she voiced her concerns over the investigation. The investigation meaning that who was supposed to be overseeing Alex not the investigation into the death, but the the agencies that should have been looking over Alex. However, one thing that jumps out is how the connectivity between the two provinces may have been able to make a difference in the outcome of Alex. And she would explain that it is critical to acquire all the information because government authorities were involved in the adolescent's life during its entirety. She said, it appears to me that the collaboration between provinces should at the very least be studied in the inquiry and it may wind up being a part of the recommendations, but it cannot determine who was legally responsible for the death between the two departments. And so I just have to say, here we are many years later and many more children slipping through the cracks with the same thing, with nothing changing. Universal system, it's just unfortunate that it continues to happen. The court determined that the parents were responsible for the most heinous kind of murder and sentenced them to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It's just unfortunate because not only did Alex's siblings lose their brother, but they lost their parents as well. It's just very sad. I don't know what to say about this case, you guys. I am equally as mad that the fact that we don't have a universal system as I am at the parents. And the fact that they are the crappiest, worthless, and neglectful as it gets, in my opinion. And all this could have been avoided. And it's just sad that it went on for so long as it did. He was 15 years old. He could have given himself the meds if they had given them to him. At age 10, he could have figured it out. Kids are figuring out joysticks and video games and all that. He could figure out an up, up insulin pin. And they also have, you know, those patches that you put on. I don't know if that was an option, but anyways, whatever. It, hindsight is always 2020, and it's, I'm just, it just breaks my heart that they just watched him wither away. Let's leave a blue heart for Alex and his surviving brothers and sisters that I am sure miss him deeply. Thanks to all my channel members and my Patreons who continue to support me. If you would like early access to new videos or decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop. Well, if you have made it to the end, you are a rock star and I love you to death. There are more true crime cases in my Crimey Cases playlist for you to check out. Stay safe, my loves, and remember, if you see something, say something. Bye.